Okay, so last time we were studying the calculus on the space R2 minus the origin, and we found this interesting vector field um, defined as follows. And it has this property that the curl of f is equal to zero, but f is not the gradient of any function. And we saw that this was interesting because um, if f was defined on the entire plane, then uh, the curl of f being equal to zero was a sufficient condition for f being the gradient of some function. Um, so the way this function looks is it's going to be some counterclockwise spiral going around the origin. And what happens is like these arrows, if you were to put an object there, it would make the object want to move counterclockwise. But the fact that uh, the arrows get smaller as you move further away make the object want to move clockwise, and these two forces counteract to make the curl equal to exactly zero. Um, we, however, saw that this had a very special place um, because if we have another vector field, H, uh, defined on R2 minus zero, and this had the property that the curl of h was equal to zero, then we found that h was almost equal to the gradient of some primitive function, small h, but we had to have some correcting factor um, f times some constant. And so this sort of expression can be well understood because we can understand this first part by studying just the single function, small h, and we can understand the second part because we have an explicit uh, formula for this vector field f. Um, so now we, I, I claimed in the last video that the existence of this function sort of pointed out the fact that there is a hole in our space. Um, so a word of caution is that just because a vector field is not defined at the origin doesn't mean it'll have this special property, uh, that it uh, has zero curl but is not the gradient of the function. For example, we can look at the curl of the function x, or sorry, the gradient of the function x over x squared plus y squared, and call this some vector field j. And um, this vector field will have zero curl because it's the gradient of something, and it's defined everywhere on R2 minus the origin. And it's not defined at the origin because you have a denominator of x squared plus y squared over there, but um, it's still the gradient of a function, namely x over x squared plus y squared. And so the main key property here is that if we have some loop going around the origin once, and we call this c, then the integral over c of f dot dr was equal to 2 pi, and this is not equal to 0. So what happens here is if we try to define a primitive function f um, by taking line integrals like we did last time, um, then we're going to have some well-definedness problems. And um, the real key property is that the integral over this loop, over a sub or any closed loop, I guess, um, is some non-zero constant. And um, this value also helped us decide what the value of lambda is. In particular, it's the line integral of h divided by 2 pi um, times f. So now we're going to ask a similar problem, except we're going to change our space up a little bit. So instead of looking at r2 minus just the origin, we're going to look at the space r2 uh, minus two points. So the first point is the origin, like we had before. And the second point is the point a, b. And we're going to call the space m. M is short for manifold. You don't need to know what a manifold is right now. We'll go over it later. But um, just for a consistent notation going forward. Um, and so we can see that F is still a vector field from M. So it's a function from M to R2. And we still have the property that the curl of F is equal to zero everywhere on M. But F is not the gradient of some function F. However, I claim that we can find another function which has this exact same property, and it really is, um, in a sense, distinct from f. And that function, or that vector field, I should say, is g of xy is equal to f of x minus a, y minus b. So if we were to graph this out, um, let's say that we have our point a, b over here, then uh, g will look like some kind of clockwise spiral going around this way. And what happens is, let's say that we have this loop uh, c, which goes around this point, then we have that the integral over c of g dot dr is going to be equal to 2 pi because this suggests the same thing as the integral over um, some loop going around the origin of f dot dr since we just shifted everything up to the point a, b. And moreover, the curl of g is equal to 0 everywhere because g is just some translate of f and f has a 0 curl everywhere. So because the integral over this closed loop is some non-zero value, we have the fact that the curl of g is equal to zero, but g is not the gradient of any function. So now we're gonna analyze um, this problem in a bit more detail and ask the question, let's say that we have some vector field h, which goes from m to r2, such that it has the property that the curl is equal to zero. 
Um, what sort of information can we have about if h is the gradient of some function h? And in order to answer this, um, let's draw a picture. So we have um, r2 minus r origin, and our second point, so this will be the point a, b, and this will be our origin. And let's consider two loops, c1 and c2. And so what we have is that the integral over c1 of f dot dr is equal to 2 pi, and the integral over c2 of g dot dr is equal to 2 pi as well. So C1 and C2 are loops that go around the origin once and uh, the point AB exactly once. And in particular, it also doesn't go around the other point. And the reason why we don't want, for example, C1 to go around to AB is so that we can state that the integral over C1 of G dot dr is equal to zero. Because um, G uh, can be sort of defined at the origin, right? Because uh, if we plug in 0, 0, then we're going to have f of minus a minus b, which is defined over here. Um, and so we can pretend like this hole wasn't there, and we can use our argument that the curl of g is equal to 0 to have that this loop integral over c1 is equal to 0 for g. And similarly, the integral over c2 of f dot dr is going to be equal to 0. So um, last time we saw that. Um, the integral over c1 was sort of the only obstruction to having zero curl but not being the gradient of a function because it's the only possible way that you can take two loops, for example, uh, the loop going around the top part of the circle, the loop going around the bottom of the circle, um, where if you tried integrating around those two paths, then um, you would get different values at the end point, and so you can't have a well-defined primitive. But over here we have uh, two distinct conditions. So if we have uh, some vector field h that sets the curl of h is equal to zero, then we can consider the integral over c1 of h dot dr, and the integral over uh, c2 of h dot dr. And uh, these are two sort of independent conditions which sort of block h from being the gradient of a function. Because f um, has zero curl, but it has a non-zero value over here and a zero value over here. While g also has zero curl, but it sort of has the opposite. It has a non-zero value over here and a zero value over here. So we can ask uh, some other question. Let's say that we take um, another loop. Um, let's say this big loop over here. And let's call this c3. So we can ask, can we find some function where maybe, or some vector field, where the integral over c1 is zero, integral over c2 is zero, but maybe the integral over c3 of h dr is non-zero. And so if the integral over any closed loop is non-zero, then we can't have a well-defined primitive because we're going to have some well-definedness issues. Um, and so we can ask this question, and it turns out that the answer is no. And the reason is the integral over c3 of h dot dr is equal to the integral over c1 of h dot dr plus the integral of c2 of h dot dr. Now, why is this true? We can argue similarly to we did last time. Um, where we said that if you have two paths that you can deform from one to another, then the integrals are going to have the same value. So what we do is we take the difference of these two quantities, and um, so Green's theorem pretty much tells us that this is going to be the double integral over r prime of h, uh, sorry, curl of h dA. So what is r prime? r prime is the region within C3, but outside of C1 and C2. So it'll be this sort of intermediate region over here. So notice that this region, r prime, um, doesn't contain any of the holes. And so what that means is that um, the curl of h, since it's zero everywhere on m, um, it'll be zero inside this entire region. And so this is just the integral of zero, and that is equal to zero. Which means that the difference of these two quantities is equal to zero. And so the integral around C3, this big loop, is going to be just the sum of the integrals around C1 and C2. Which means that um, if these two guys are zero, then you can't find some vector field for which uh, the integral over this third loop is not zero. So using similar logic, you can show that if you take any path in M, any closed loop in M, then the integral of h dot dr is going to be equal to M times, let's give these guys names. So let's say that the integral over C1 is alpha and the integral over C2 is beta. So it'll be m times alpha plus n times beta, where um, m and n are some integers, and they pretty much count the amount of times that uh, your path c winds around the origin is equal to m, and the amount of times that it winds around uh, the point a, b is equal to n. And so using the similar argument of like taking the difference and then um, showing that it's the integral of the curl, which is zero, 
Uh, you can show that any arbitrary loop, you can count the amount of times it winds around the origin in the second point, and we can express this integral as just being some combination of these two guys uh, multiplied by some integers. So in particular, what that implies is that if alpha and beta are both equal to zero, then we don't have any obstructions to finding a well-defined primitive h as h equals the integral over gamma of h dot dr, where as usual, h, uh, gamma starts at some initial point and ends at x, y. Um, because the integral over any closed loop, if alpha and beta are both zero, then um, this will be equal to zero, and so we don't have any problems of well-defining this here in terms of our path gamma. Um, okay. So what we find here is pretty much that these two quantities, the integral over um, some loop that passes through the origin but not this other point, and the integral over this loop which passes through the other point but not the origin, are the only two conditions that we need to figure out whether or not h is the gradient of some function. Because if both of these quantities are zero, then it is. But if even one of these quantities is non-zero, then it isn't. And so the fact that there are two restrictions corresponds to the fact that there are two holes in our space um, m. And we can actually do a bit better than that. And similarly to last time, we can sort of fix these issues using our speci specially defined functions um, f and g, or vector fields, sorry. Um, so we can define another vector field h bar, which is going to be equal to h minus alpha over 2 pi f minus beta over 2 pi g. Um, and so alpha and beta are, we're, we're going to start with some vector field h, which has zero curl and alpha and beta are the line integrals over these two loops, and then we define this new vector field h bar. So we can consider what is the line integral over c1 of h bar dot dr, and so this will be the integral of h uh, over c1 plus the integral of f over c1 plus the integral of g over c1. Um, sorry, this should be minus alpha over 2 pi and minus beta over 2 pi. And so this will come out to being alpha minus alpha over 2 pi times uh, 2 pi because we uh, have over here that the integral of f over c1 is 2 pi and then this quantity is going to be equal to 0 because the integral over c1 of g is equal to 0. And so the 2 pi's cancel and the alphas cancel and so this comes out to be 0. So what we find is that the integral over c1 of h bar dot dr is equal to 0. And similarly, if we change the path to the other path c2, then uh, we can do a similar analysis to say that, okay, um, we have that the integral of h over c2 is equal to beta. We have that the integral of f over c2 is zero, so that doesn't matter. And we have that the integral of g over c2 is equal to two pi, so this will be beta over two pi times two pi. Um, again, the two pi's cancel, the betas cancel, and this comes out to be zero. And so what we find then is that integral over c1 of h dot dr is equal to the integral over c2 of h dot dr, so h bar, and both of these are equal to zero. Um, because we've corrected for these problematic non-zero, potentially non-zero values by subtracting off that multiple of f and g. So now we argue that this implies that the integral of any loop in m, a uh, closed loop of h bar dot dr is equal to zero, and so what this implies is that we don't have any well-defined is issues and we can have some uh, potential function h bar uh, where the gradient of h bar is equal to um, big h bar. And in the usual way, we just define it as being uh, the line integral of h bar dot dr. Um, so another way that we can say this is that we can focus on our function h, which has zero curl. And we have that this condition implies that h is almost equal to the gradient of some uh, primitive potential function. Um, except we need to correct this by adding some constant lambda f and some other constant mu g. So lambda and mu are just constants, and um, these are already some specially defined vector fields. And so we find that, similarly to last time, um, f was the only function that we needed to correct this problem that you have zero curl but um, was not the gradient of something. And here, we have two functions that you need to correct the problem. And these two functions are independent of each other because of like these relations being independent of each other. And so the fact that there are two functions over here corresponds to the fact that uh, there are two holes over here. Um, and so hopefully you can sort of see the, um, how to generalize this, that if we have endpoints over here, 
then we can sort of do the same trick and translate our vector field f to those endpoints. And um, those will give us n different functions to sort of correct this problem. And we have that those functions are enough because um, the only possible instructions that we have come from loops that contain like one of those n um, points, but uh, none of the other n minus one points. And if we integrate around those loops and all those integrals are zero, then um, we have that we can find a well-defined primitive. And similarly, we can do this process of subtracting off some multiples of our special translates of f. And um, we can fix this issue by saying that our function a, our vector field h, which has zero curl, is a gradient of some function plus um, these n special vector fields. So the fact that our space has n holes corresponds to the fact that we need n functions to um, fix this property of a vector field having zero curl, but not being the gradient of some function. So hopefully that gives you sort of a stronger sense of seeing that um, studying calculus over some space actually does give you topological information because like the number of functions that you need to fix this property gives you exactly the number of holes that you have in your space. So in the next video, we'll look at three dimensions and things get a bit more interesting there because we actually have three differential operators, the gradient, the curl, and the divergence. And so seeing how these operators interact, we'll see a similar phenomenon that um, we'll have some special functions, and these special functions tell us some rich facts about the topology of our space. And um, that'll give us a better sense of, more of a sense of what drum homology is trying to say.